get away. Right? So, thank you for coming out on this very chilly night and braving the cold and the, and the dark and all those kinds of things to come to this uh, evening at Skid Away lecture tonight. We really appreciate your attendance here and uh, hope that uh, you uh, are really excited about our uh, speaker tonight. Uh, this is Dr. Sarah Rivero Calle, who uh, comes to us with a PhD uh, in 2016 from John Hopkins University in Biological Oceanography. From there, she went on to do a postdoctoral uh, scholarship uh, appointment at the University of Southern California, the other USC. Um, and then she went on to UNC Bloomington, where she first got involved with uh, small sets, uh, cube sets. And then she joined us in 2020 as an assistant professor in biological oceanography in the Department of Marine Sciences at UGA and here at the UGA Skidaway Institute of Oceanography. Um, before the talk starts, I just want to mention that if you're not on our mailing list, we have a sign-up sheet over here on the table uh, in, on my right, and a couple of our newsletters if you're interested in reading about some of the work that's being done at Skidaway and what our students and faculty are doing as well. And I encourage you to pick one up. I encourage you to join our friends group if you're not already a friend, and you'll get the newsletter in the mail and via email as well. And again, thank you all for coming. Dr. Thank you, Clark. And thank you all for being here. I really appreciate it. As Clark said, it's a pretty chilly night um, and it's dark. So, but I think it's going to be worth your time. I sure hope so. And I'm just going to jump right onto it. Um, so the title of this talk that Mike helped me uh, put together was actually Scenes of Planet Earth from the Perspective of Seahawk CubeSat, the Miniature Ocean Color Satellite. So that was a handful, so I shortened it to a Seahawk trip around planet Earth. Okay, so the first thing that you're probably wondering is what is this CubeSat? Um, basically, a CubeSat is a miniature satellite, and it's, uh, it has the shape of a cube. And I have brought with me here a replica of our um, 3D printed CubeSat. This is the actual size that I'm going to be talking about tonight. It's the, we call it um, the toaster or the shoebox, and you'll hear why in a minute. Um, but the idea of CubeSat started off as an educational program in California, and the idea was that they wanted to build something very low cost that would serve an educational purpose. You can imagine uh, one unit of a CubeSat is about uh, um, this size, uh, 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters. Sorry, I'm European, I still think in centimeters. Mm -hmm. um, and so, then you can start adding more units to that, and we talk about um, larger sizes as 1U, 2U, 3U. So our satellite is a 3U, so it has three units. Um, but it can be as big as a 24U, for example. Um, and as I was saying, there's a lot of advantages to the use of this technology from the, um, just the, how quickly you can build something this size, although there, there's some anecdotes about this with respect to ours. Um, it's also very simple technology, it's uh, off the shelf technology. And um, because they're so small and we uh, launch them with other satellites, it's actually very low cost to build and launch these type of satellites. And um, the other thing about it is that we're all worried about the space debris, because everybody's launching satellites these days. As you know, um, there's the Starlink constellation of satellites uh, that you've probably heard about. Um, so one advantage of the CubeSats is that as they re-enter, because satellites, they're always kind of falling uh, towards Earth. So as they re-enter um, Earth, they will automatically disintegrate. So that's another advantage of this. And so there's been, um, since the initial educational purpose, there's also been um, missions for 
um, scientific research for uh, government and for commercial purposes. You've probably heard about Planet as well. That's a commercial company. And the other uh, thing that you might want to know about this satellite is that there's different altitudes from Earth at which it would orbit around Earth. And so these CubeSats, they orbit at um, what we call a low Earth orbit. So that means that it takes about 90 minutes to go around the Earth one time. All right, so now what's Seahawk? What's, what's this satellite? So as Clark mentioned, um, I was a postdoc at UNCW before I came here, and that's when I first started uh, getting familiar with CubeSats and learning about this. And the mascot of UNCW, which is where the PI of the project came from, are Seahawks. They're very good in basketball. And so they decided that that would be a great name for an Earth observing satellite too, especially an, a satellite designed to observe the ocean. So that's why we called it Seahawk. Um, but this project was actually called SOCON, the Sustained Ocean Color Observation and Nanosatellites. Nanosatellites is just um, a size of miniature satellites. And it was a project that brought together um, all these different people. We had peop uh, the PI from UNCW, John Morrison. Um, we had uh, another PI from NASA, Gene Feldman. And then we had private industries. We had Clyde Space, who actually, they were from Scotland, and they actually built the platform. And then we had Alan Holmes, who built the actual sensor with which we took images from the Earth. Um, and then when I joined UGA, we became part of that partnership. But Seahawk started in 2014, and I joined the project in 2018. And the idea of Seahawk was we wanted to demonstrate that we could build a high-quality sensor on board a satellite, a miniature satellite, a CubeSat. And so this was a proof-of-concept project. Nobody had done this before for an ocean color satellite. And the idea is that we wanted to demonstrate that this technology was ripe for us to use it for scientific purposes, and that we could provide high-quality, high-resolution, uh, low-cost imagery. And so that was the, the main idea of the project. To put things in perspective, I'm showing you here um, some of the past ocean color satellites that we've launched. Um, and the first one was in 1978, was this Nimbus CCCS, um, the second one starting from the left. And then from there, we started um, improving the technology, but also the size and adding more sensors to it. So we ended up having this huge one that was um, launched in 2002, which is an Europe, a European one, Mary's. And so to put things in perspective, this is where Seahawk comes in. Wow. Really tiny. I'm telling you, this is the actual size. <laughs> um, and this project wouldn't have happened without this magnificent team. So I've mentioned before um, the PI from UNCW, John Morrison. And he doesn't like me to show this picture, but I like to show it because before we had a model, we always talked about how it would be the size of a loaf of bread. So here he is with a loaf of bread. Um, and then we have Gene, who was part of Gene and Alan Holmes, Gene from NASA and Alan Holmes, um, built a lot of the technology associated with these ocean color satellites. And this is here, Alan, with two replicas of the actual sensor that went into the Seahawk. And the name of the sensor is Hawkeye. Again, very fitting. You get this theme there. And then this was um, in 2018 when I went to Scotland. I joined the project as a postdoc. And I went to Scotland, and they showed me uh, a dummy of what the satellite actually looked like so that we had a, uh, an idea. And something that I always like to tell people about this is that remember we had this 3U satellite. And uh, when Gina and John talked to Alan, and they said, Alan, we need you to build another ocean color sensor. But this time, it's for a CubeSat, so it needs to be very small. He's like, OK, I got it. How small are we talking about? Well, it's a 3U CubeSat. And he's like, oof, that's going to be tough. And they're like, well, actually, 
only one U is dedicated to the sensor. The other two U's, the other two units, are going to be all the brains and the machinery, all the engineering parts of the satellite. So um, he started drafting a, a design, and the next day he had a design, and that's actually what we use today. He's brilliant, and we've continued to work together. Okay, so again, just a reminder of um, how small it is and the low cost and why that's an advantage. One of the advantages, too, is that because it's so small, we don't have to have a dedicated rocket. We can share the rocket with other CubeSats. So our satellite was actually part of a 64 satellite launch. And it was uh, thanks to Spaceflight, which is part of SpaceX, and um, we were the first largest uh, single rideshare mission from a US-based uh, vehicle. And it was an international um, uh, project. But Space Flight really liked the idea of our ocean color satellite. And so they uh, really featured us in all the PR. And so in December 2018, I joined June, December, we were launching. And uh, this was our first contact with a satellite. This was in the AAM. I was actually wearing my pajamas down there. <laughs> um, and we were all very excited. We made communication with the satellite. The next important uh, landmark was getting our first image, right? And so um, I, at the moment, created the UNCW CubeSat Club. And so these were all graduate students. And these were two faculty members. And we all came together to listen for the time when the ground station was downloading the image. And so I have a little recording here for you that will explain why we call it the shoe box. Let me see if I can play it. Houston, we have a problem. OK, let's see. So hard to navigate. <laughs> ah. okay. It's not working. All right, well, I'll show you later then. Um, but the idea is that we were very excited because we finally got an image. That was a proof of concept. That was the main thing that we needed to do with this first phase of the mission. And so this is an image that we picked from Monterey Bay, very close to the Moore Foundation, which I forgot to mention, they were the ones who funded the project. Um, and so you see here an image. Um, this is what we call a true color image, which is most of what you'll be seeing today. And to the right, you see what we call a chlorophyll product. Chlorophyll tells us about the productivity of the ocean. So that's um, our chlorophyll product of the same image. And to the right, that's the coarse resolution data that we got from the bus, bus size satellite. So not only are we getting good images, but they're also better than what we were producing before with the really expensive satellites. So with that, we had confirmed that uh, we proved the concept. And the sky was the limit now. So we've been collecting about 9,000 images from around the world between 2021 and 2023. And if you're interested and in, you're into Instagram, um, you can check us out. This is the handle. But main thing that I want to convey here is that the Seahawk mission has been the most comprehensive global high-resolution uh, high data set of inland and coastal waters. We were getting imagery at 120 meter resolution from around the world. OK, now the part that you're all waiting for. Let's go on a tour and let's see what we found. So I've selected a number of images from different places around the world for different reasons. And some of them are anecdotal. You'll see why. OK, so first, if you don't if you've never met me before, I'm actually a biologist. Never thought I would be working with NASA or launching satellites or anything of the kind. My thing was looking at little critters in the microscope. And then I started doing some remote sensing, so analyzing satellite imagery. And one of my favorite um, 
phytoplankton or microalgae is uh, the coccolithophores. And coccolithophores are um, very interesting because they are like mini plants, so they do photosynthesis, but they build these um, shields of calcium carbonate. So imagine little shields of chalk around its single cell. These are actually microscopic. These are in the order of like six microns in diameter. You cannot see them with the naked eye. You need a microscope. When they bloom in large quantities, they can be seen from space. And their little skeletons will go to the bottom of the ocean, and when they accumulate, they then can be responsible of um, geological features such as the White Cliffs of Dover, with, uh, which you may have heard about in England. So, as I was saying, these coccolithophores, because they're white, they reflect a lot of light. This is the actual color that you would see from space of a bloom of coccolithophores. It looks like someone dropped milk in the water. These are two images from Norway. And uh, this was a big part of my thesis, understanding coccolithophores from the perspective. You've heard about ocean acidification, what would happen with them in the future as the ocean becomes more acidic. But there was another critter that I was also very interested in for a different reason, and that is trichodesmium. Trichodesmium is another type of microalgae that has this ability of uh, fixing nitrogen, which means that they don't need that source of nitrate in the water. They can use the dissolved nitrogen from the atmosphere into the, into the um, water and they turn that into ammonia and they transform that and they have their own supply. And that gives them a very interesting advantage um, in areas where there's very low nutrients. And so this is a map of where we expect to see trichodesmium. This red area here is all oligotrophic areas. What I mean by that is low nutrient areas. They're also very warm. And it's, a, it's like, imagine a desert. Nobody as a plant wants to grow there. There's no food, it's very hot. And so they have this ability and advantage to grow in those areas. Except in my thesis, I found that they could also be found in the North Atlantic. So that was a very interesting finding. So I was very excited when I looked at this Seahawk image and I could see these leaks of trichodesmium along the coast of Perth. But people in Perth are not so excited about this because it looks like sawdust. It looks as if somebody has dropped um, some sort of disgusting thing in the water. And so to give you an example, the Port Authority of Perth came up with this pamphlet or flyer to explain to people, this is not toxic, don't worry about it, it's a natural algae, it's all good. But this happens in many places around the world. Some of them are famous for their beaches and for recreation. This is an example from Tenerife, the Canary Islands, which is um, an archipelago um, of the coast of Africa that is part of Spain, where I'm from. And so it touched, um, it touched very close to home. And a friend of mine was saying, Sarah, remember when we were talking that day over lunch about this trichodesmin thing? They're here, they're in Tenerife. Um, and so it was a big fuss there because people were thinking that it had to do with um, chemical spills. And uh, because they, there was such a huge bloom, they were all over the place and they were closing the beaches. And so it was a big mess to explain to people, no, these are fine, they're just a big bloom, they'll go away, don't worry about it. Okay, now let's go to a different part of the world. Another um, plankton that I'm very interested in is Noctiluca, and they're very common in the Arabian Sea. One of the things that I like, because I study ocean color and changes in the color of the ocean, um, is that this organism is capable of showing two different colors, green and red. And they're also mixotropes, which means that they can both do photosynthesis, but also eat other preys. So this is how these blooms would look like in the ocean. Very, very um, distinct. But they can also be bioluminescent. So this is a very strange organism to me, and so I'm planning on doing more work on this. So I'll give you a glimpse of 
one of the things that uh, we've been looking at with Seahawk. So this is a Hawkeye image from the Arabian Sea, and these are all these swirls and sleeks. And this is the chlorophyll product that tells me um, a little bit more clearly where these organisms are. And so I'm trying to actually quantify them. And because they're so patchy and they move around so much, it's really difficult to do this if you don't have high resolution imagery. So I'm trying to use Hawkeye to demonstrate this and um, quantify by how much we're underestimating them. Another cool thing about um, Hawkeye is that we can turn it and twist it so that it follows the same target over, the, over time. And so because I was interested in seeing where uh, these were happening and they're associated with harmful algal blooms and um, hypoxia and all sorts of problems, we, I told my team, I, let's track the Arabian Sea region for a whole week. Let's do that experiment. And so here you have the full sequence for a week and you see them moving around. And in fact, you also see something that we didn't expect, which is the sandstorm. And I'm going to be referring to this in the next few slides, too. OK, another interesting thing is that sometimes we think we know it's plankton, but if we're not really there in the water taking the sample, we can't really tell. So something funny that happened is that we were looking at these um, cyanobacteria blooms in the Baltic Sea. And we were thinking, oh, see, the swirls, they, they're probably cyanobacteria. Turns out that there were some other uh, researchers who actually went there, and they were suspicious about it. And they looked at it, and it was not cyanobacteria. It was pollen. And so they published this paper on um, the spectral reflectance, which is what we use from satellite imagery to distinguish the two. And they were saying, oh, there's actually a lot of pollen. And they looked at a time series of what was happening. And with climate change, there was more pollen and longer time periods of pollen there. And so if you're familiar with these news, if you live in Savannah, you've probably come across this with your car, right? It looks really yellow. Um, so this makes a lot of sense to you now when I tell you that that's pollen in the water and not cyanobacteria. OK, change of topic. Now we're going to the Falkland Islands. And um, this is, maybe some of you are more familiar with this um, than my students. Um, there was a big war in the Falkland Islands, and there's still a lot of issues between Argentina and the UK. Um, this is a really interesting area because it's also a very productive area, not only for the oil, but also fisheries. Um, so we took um, Seahawk images from this region, and you see, you can, I don't know if you can see it very well from afar, but you can see that there's different colors in the water. So not all of it is green. There's some red. We looked at the chlorophyll, and there's some really interesting patterns going on. So this is another region um, for you to think about what's going on in the water. From there, we're going to the Ross Sea. And one of the advantages of satellites is that we can get where, some people, where it's really hard to get remote areas, right? So um, we don't know a lot about this transition between the ice melting and the start of phytoplankton blooms and how that happens and how that might be changing over time. So with satellites, we're starting to uh, look into this. And I want to point out, zooming in at this area down here, oop, this area down here where you're starting to see how the ocean is getting a little bit greener. That's a bloom forming in there. So um, imagine having to go on a really expensive boat that takes you several weeks to get there versus taking several images um, per day. So there's a great advantage to using satellites. But as you may have seen with the pollen, sometimes it's hard to tell what's what. So we still need to use boats. OK, from here, we're going somewhere warmer. This is the Caspian Sea, which is this part. And then um, I'm sharing some snippets of emails that we, within the Seahawk team, exchange. And so Alan wrote in this one, Hey, here's a good picture of the Garabagzala, well, however you say that, 
which is this region here. It translates to the Black Strait Lake in Turkmenistan. And it's one of the saltiest bodies of water, um, around 35% salt, which is very close to the Dead Sea. Um, so this was another interesting finding. You see how the color is very different. In this area, you can also sometimes find um, coccolithophores, which might be responsible for this. OK, another funny story. Um, well, not so funny. There was an Icelandic volcano um, that erupted in, uh, during this time period. And Jean, who is a big fan of Jules Verne, said, please take an image from there. And he sent us this email. And he said, this was my favorite book growing up. These are the runic um, uh, quotation from the book. And this is what it means. So it's just a little anecdote for you um, about his interest in this book. OK, from here, we're going to the River Nile. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with the famous Nile Delta in Cairo. And of course, what's there? Satellite, oh, we satellites, <laughs> pyramids. Um, so this is an image from Hawkeye showing this beautiful Nile Delta. <coughs> and just to put things in perspective, um, this area is also um, in the border with um, Israel. And the, there's some interesting places of, on the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aqaba that we're going to visit next. So this is the Red Sea, and we're going through south um, through the Red Sea. And you can see the Sharm el Sheikh area is very famous for um, scuba diving. Then we've got uh, Eritrea there and um, Saudi Arabia and Djibouti. And there's two things that I want to remark here. One of them is the sandstorms that we've talked about briefly. And the other thing is that if you look closely, there are some swirls here. The Red Sea was named apparently after trichodesmium blooms, trichodesmium erythrium. And erythrium comes from the word red. So trichodesmium has this red brownish color. And that's why the Red Sea, which is nothing like red, as you can see here, when there's trichodesmium, it becomes red. And that's where the name comes from. OK, so let's talk some more about this area. So we have the Gulf of Suez here and the Gulf of Aqaba here. And this is the Sinai Peninsula. You've probably heard about the Suez Canal, right? Um, and as you know, it's a very important commercial route. It really saves a lot of time and money if we can go through uh, the Red Sea into the Mediterranean and into Europe. And in March 2021, we captured this image um, with Hawkeye. You can see up here, Turkey, and then Cyprus Island, and then down below, Egypt, which we've been talking about. And we're now going to zoom in. So if you zoom into this very area, this is where the Suez Canal is. And if we zoom in a little bit more, this is no longer a Hawkeye image, but just so that you know, this was a boat that got stuck in the Suez Canal in March 2021 because of a sandstorm. And if you look closely, there's lots of little colored dots here in the bottom. Those are boats waiting for this other boat <laughs> to unplug and come in. This issue costed $9 billion. So it's not a minor problem. And that's why I wanted to share it with you, because this was in the middle of the pandemic and supply chain issues, which if you're a starting professor, you'd hear about. <laughs> um, but everybody suffered it. So I just wanted to tell you about this little story about the Swiss Canal. OK, so more deserts now. This is one of my favorite images um, from Hawkeye, or regions for which we've had images. This is in Namibia, in, in Western Africa, in the southern part. These are beautiful red dunes by the ocean. If you do a close-up, you can see the dunes. They are ginormous. And Namibia has been um, one of the driest places on Earth. It's been even uh, longer than the uh, Sahara Desert, 
They think it's uh, dry for at least 55 million, if not 80. And while it's not the largest in the world, it is certainly the oldest. And it rivals with the Atacama Desert in Chile because of um, how dry it is. And here's some images that I found on the internet so that you can see how this looks like up close. From the desert, we're going to very humid areas now. And so this is a little homage to one of my students, Masood, who's from Bangladesh. So Masood has been working on the team um, scheduling images for the group. And so he was interested in getting Hawkeye imagery from this area. So you can really see all this mud and fresh water coming in, how green and lush it is compared to the desert now. And um, a little shout out, if you don't know much about Bangladesh like I didn't before I met Masood, um, Bangladesh became independent in 1947 um, when there was the partition of India. And it's got beautiful temples and beautiful landscapes. Oh, there's an issue with WebEx. It's signed out of WebEx. Um, You're keep going. Keep going? OK. So um, Bangladesh, as I said, is a very beautiful country, but it's also one of the most populated in the world. In this little area, there's 170 million people. It's the eighth most populated in the world. From here, we're going to Rio de la Plata, another muddy place. If you've never heard of Rio de la Plata, maybe this could help. It is... Um, the discharge of two main rivers in South America, the Uruguay and the Paraná. And um, it's a mix. Uh, some people consider it a bay. Some people consider it an estuary. Some people consider it a marginal sea. But as you can see here, it's really muddy. And um, it was uh, explored by the Portuguese and Spanish in the 1500s. They were trying to see if they could go through there to cut across to the um, other side of uh, South America without going down south. And the name Rio de la Plata, Plata means uh, silver in Spanish, and so it has to do with the trade of silver and um, um, gold in the area. And you probably heard about Buenos Aires. Buenos Aires is right here, this white area. Um, and Next to it, we have Montevideo, and then from there, it drains out into the southern, southern um, Atlantic. One more muddy one. I really like this image. Um, this is closer to home. This is Louisiana, Mississippi coast. And um, I really like the patterns that we see from all the mud from the Mississippi River and all the mixing in there. OK, the sale bon roule. From here, we're going to another place in the US. Perhaps you've been there, Great Salt Lake in Utah. And um, it also has some very interesting colors in the water. If you look at it up close, you see that it, it has two shades. And it's completely divided. And John, uh, one of the PIs, uh, made this little comment, so I'm also showing this here. He was saying, I, I always find it interesting that there are two regimes in salt, like high salt in the north and low salt in the south, divided by a man-made railway, railway causeway. Um, anyways, uh, we thought it was, um, it was, or I thought, this is the first time I saw Salt Lake from above, and I thought it was something wrong with the contrast or the photoshopping that we were doing, but now this is the real color. And as a testament of that, you can see the red color over there on the right. Okay. Now moving to the Great Lakes in the US. Um, one of the things that we also try to do is take images of the same location over time to see how it changes. 
Um, and in particular, the Great Lakes, if you've been hearing the news, um, has been subject to some very nasty algae blooms too that have affected the um, drinking water. So you can sort of see them a little bit in the third image there. From there, we're jumping to another lake, um, the Great Slave Lake in Canada, which was home to the Diné people. The Diné were called slaves by this other <coughs> enemy tribe, and so that's where the name slave comes from. And there was a lot of fur trade um, in that area. So we also looked at how this area that's in higher latitudes changes over time, and you can see from all these um, ice covered how it starts breaking, and then it becomes all completely green over time. <clears throat> all right, from there we're jumping to Africa to find another very interesting lake, Lake Tanganyika. And this is an area that's surrounded by a lot of um, uh, countries. So it's an area that is uh, very rich in um, its fisheries and resources, and so there's always um, a lot of discussion about um, this area. And I added one of Alan's notes when he analyzed this image, and I am adding it because there's a reference to Thanksgiving, and he was saying lots of color in these lakes. As you can see, we have blue, brown, and green. Lake Tanganyika <coughs> Basin has a population of over 10 million, so the water quality is important here. Again, fisheries are important here. Um, there's also a swamp in a challenging place for adventurous birders. And uh, if he finishes with safari tours are also available on the web. So think about this while you're eating turkey over Thanksgiving. So I'm just reading some of these emails because we had so much fun looking at images from around the world and sharing memories. And I thought you might enjoy that. Okay, another huge lake. This is the last one. This is Lake Titicaca. This is in South America. It is... Um, in the Andes, so this is one of the largest in South America, but it's uh, definitely one of the highest, and it's navigable. Nav navigable? I don't know how you say this in English. Um, point is, you can navigate through it. And they have these floating islands and very interesting boats. Um, so um, this is another interesting area for water quality and fisheries for as a resource for this um, uh, these people here. From here, we're going to the exotic Bahamas. And so I wanted to show you this image because these colors might remind you of coccolithophores. And that's because they have uh, beautiful white sand beaches that are also made of calcium carbonate. So this is an area where our algorithm to distinguish coccolithophores in the ocean becomes really tricky, and we need to know that that's not coccolithophore. This is just sand, and it's very shallow. As, as a testament of that, I added a little picture there to think about a warmer, sunnier place than we are today. Okay, and then back to polar areas. I just wanted to show you this amazing ice swirls and Alan's comment um, about what's going on here. I, we've collected a bunch of images from polar regions. I'm not an expert in polar regions, but I'm uh, really looking forward to digging into this some more and finding out more about what's going on. And um, just a couple more anecdotes. Um, this is... Um, so that you have a reference, this is a Hawkeye image. The swath is about 200 uh, kilometers wide, and about 700 um, in length. So this is an ice sheet that got detached from Antarctica and was making its way north. And everybody was talking about it in the news. And I can imagine that this is about 100 kilometers by 50 kilometers. I did a master's in Puerto Rico. That's about the size of Puerto Rico, so that you have an idea. Um, and then Alan got fancy with it and looked at another ice sheet, and he took two images, one in blue and one in red, and overlapped them. And with that, he calculated the drift of this iceberg sheet. And so he calculated that it was about 5.4 kilometers per day. 
just another cool thing that you can do with these images. Then um, you probably heard about the Tonga volcanic eruption in January 15, 2022. There's a sound to it, but it's not sounding. So I'll just guide you through it. It was uh, an underwater volcanic eruption and um, it was massive. We hadn't seen anything like this before. And we had all sorts of satellites, um, not just ours, but other types of satellites at the moment out there. So there's recordings and videos from different perspectives with all those satellites. One of the uh, researchers from Lamont, who was uh, originally the program manager at the Moore Foundation when we got the first phase of the project approved, contacted us and he said, hey, can you please take images with Hawkeye um, from the area? I'm trying to go there because um, we think that all these volcanic ash is going to act as fertilizer for phytoplankton and want to try and see the effect. And so we got him some images. This was from February 13th and February 14th. He was super excited because um, you could see what we thought was chlorophyll um, filaments going um, north from here. And he was thinking, oh, we can calculate the velocity at which, at which it moves and so forth. Um, I just came back from a conference two weeks ago where somebody was saying that so we have to look at this very closely because some of the reflectance that we think is chlorophyll is actually not chlorophyll, it's um, just volcanic ash in the water. So we'll have to revise this. But this shows just how we were able to act really quickly and help someone in the um, scientific community. Okay, and now it's time to go home. So we're back in the South Atlantic Bight, and this is our beautiful coast. And because this was one of the um, areas of interest, we also followed it throughout time. And so we wanted to see how it changed um, with the seasons. So this was in March 15th, 2022. This was in August. And then hurricane came. And so we had Hurricane Ian coming through. And it was really bad timing because we had scheduled an image during an undergraduate cruise. We were going to go there, and we had to reschedule everything. So when we actually went in the water, everything was turned, it was after the hurricane, and everything was completely turned. Because it's very shallow, we had lots of sediments and uh, fresh water input coming from the rivers and chlorophyll and all sorts of things. So see how it changed and it looks a lot greener. So this was October 1st and 5th. And then this year, on October 18th, this is what it should have looked like around this time of the year. So with this, I'm now showing you um, the end of the tour. And this was an image that we took, but it was not not intentional because our license says that we're supposed to look at the Earth. And somehow, our satellite was looking at the moon. And um, there's a salsa song that I really like that says, todo tiene su final, everything has its end. And so with that, it was the end of the mission. We had been experiencing issues with controlling the, what we call the attitude of the satellite. Yes, satellites have attitude. Um, and uh, the reaction wheels were not working well, so it was hard for us to point where it was supposed to point to take the image and to point down to the ground station to download the information. So Unfortunately, in November, uh, we called it the end of the mission, and we are starting what we call the decommissioning phase. Um, as I was saying, this is related to issues with the reaction wheels. We tried everything we could, um, and we couldn't control it. It's just as satellites get old, they, uh, they get um, uh, their oil that um, lubricates the wheels run out. And so the wheels were, they were not functioning well. So remember that we launched in 2018, we're in 2023. So overall, it's been five years on orbit, which is very successful. 
Typically, CubeSats last between five and seven years. This is actually the longest lasting um, satellite mission for Clyde Space, which is one of the pioneers building CubeSats. So we're very sad, but also happy that it was a success successful mission. Um, we started the decommissioning phase, and the, one of the good news, though, is that we were very happy with how well the actual sensor, the Hawkeye, um, behaved for this past five years. There was very little degradation. Um, and hello, we've collected 9,000 images. That's amazing. And we can say that Seahawk has provided the most comprehensive global data set of high resolution coastal and inland waters. Usually, ocean color images are for the ocean. So they were not looking at coastal and inland waters as much. And so we provided that with our mission. Um, there's also lots of cool science uh, that can be done with all those 9,000 images. Some of my students here are a testament of this. We have lots of work to do still. And we still have two more years of funding. So everything's good. <laughs> um, and just um, to tell you a little bit about what this phase of the, um, uh, this third phase of which I was one of the PIs um, since 2022, until 2025, we had three main goals. One is operation, so maintaining the satellite going. Um, that has been done and completed. So the next part is science and applications, and um, I am one of the leads of that together with UNCW. And then the third part was a new thing that uh, my colleague Phil Bresnahan, who is the PI of the project at UNCW now, um, he's right here. Uh, Phil uh, came up with uh, the idea of building a low-cost instrument uh, to help us validate the data from the satellite so that we can say, oh yeah, this is pollen, or no, it's uh, um, uh, plankton. And he also is very invested in citizen science programs, so he's still working on that. So as I said, point two and three, we're still working on it. And here at Skidaway, we have all these really interesting science that we're working on, and hopefully in two years, we'll give you a lot more results. Um, and I couldn't have done this work without the initial PIs and my now colleague, um, MPI, Phil, but also my lab group. Um, I have the fortune of working with wonderful students, technicians, and um, postdocs. And it's always a lot of fun to work with them. With that, two final messages. One is there's a world of data to explore. We got all these images. Um, we're eager to do more work on them. And the other one is why did we start off with building a satellite? And that is related in part to the cost of oceanography and getting to remote places in a timely manner and following them through time. And so, just to give you a sense, uh, using an academic research fleet or UNOLS vessel like the RV Savannah that we have out here is very expensive. If we go out on the RV Savannah, that costs about 11,000 per day. If we go out on a larger global class boat, that is, for example, the RV Revell from Scripps from California, that is 50,000 per day. Think about the cost of your ha houses. If we build a CubeSat, that is half a million dollars, which is considerably expensive, but not so expensive. You just have to go out 10 days on the RV Rebel, which wouldn't even get you down to um, the Southern Ocean, and you've already made it um, profitable. And the cost of launch at the time was a quarter million dollars. That is because we were sharing it with other CubeSats because CubeSats are so popular and such a hot topic right now, this cost is actually much lower now. I need to find out the actual cost right now, but this was of, as of 2018. For reference, NASA is launching in January the PACE uh, satellite mission, which is the newest, the crown jewel that we're all very excited about. We're talking about a billion dollars. And this thing started uh, being designed when I was a grad student. So it takes a long time, a lot of money, and they're fantastic satellites. 
but there's room for the little satellites to help um, get a new uh, point of view and new information that is compatible and complementary to what the large satellites can get us. And with that, um, on behalf of the Seahawk Hawkeye team, which is a lot of us, um, thank you all for attending. And I'd be more than happy to answer any questions that you might have. How did you decide where the satellite should go, the orbit? The altitude of the orbit? No, the, the orbit of the satellite. How did you decide to go over South America versus Bangladesh, etc.? Perfect. I'm glad you asked that because I have some extra slides. So <laughs> this is my suit sitting down there. Um, we, have, um, we had a group from NASA and, um, um, and here, UGA skid away, Masood, we would all discuss where we wanted to take images from. And we had this Google form where anybody, including yourselves, could say, hey, Sarah, I want an image from my backyard. And you can send out the email, fill out this form, and you can explain why your backyard is so important and we should spare one of the images on your backyard. We had this joke with my sister getting married. She's like, can you take an image of the wedding? I was like, I don't think we could see anything at 120 meters. But anybody could submit a request. And this brings me to the orbit. And so um, because this is a small satellite, it can only hold so much information in the memory. And we go around the Earth every 90 minutes, so that means about 17 to 18 turns around the Earth per day. Our idea was to select one image per orbit per day. So here's an example. The green boxes are images that we would take from each one of the satellites. This gray area is the area that was a potential conflict with a ground station in Scotland. And then we had two ground stations, one in Alaska and one in Wallops in Maryland. So we had to make sure that there was no conflict between taking an image and downloading the data or communicating with the satellite. Um, so Masood would sit down in the computer and select these, click on these boxes and then share it with NASA. They would tell us which ones they wanted. And then we would send all that to Glasgow where they would then submit that to the satellite. Um, so that's the whole um, operation right there. Any other questions? Clark? I'm just curious why you only have like three ground stations. I mean, aren't there like a big network of download stations around the globe? Yes, but there are different types of um, antennae. And for us, we had at the time very new technology. Um, and so we had to use the ones that would have expand downlinks. So we could only use those two. We had an agreement, also this cost money. So we had an agreement with um, NASA. They paid us in kind. So that we had a NASA Space Act agreement to use their ground stations and their website, which I'm going to show next. So here, you any of you can go tonight into the Ocean Color website and select Hawkeye and the time or the date and the location, and you can download for free any images that I showed today. They also supported us by providing a software that is completely free called CDAS. Um, it has a GUI, so you can it's a free software you can install on your computer. I don't recommend that you do it because you probably don't have the skills to analyze satellite imagery, but you're welcome to do it. Um, but so CDAS had all the tools and the ability to read our data. Because what I've been showing you today is basically just pretty pictures, but there's actually data in there, like that chlorophyll that I was showing. Um, so yeah, we had that agreement with NASA, and those were the two stations that we had. You also have to have 
FCC agreements. There's just a lot of uh, bureaucracy that um, is involved with operating a satellite. And I think there was, yeah. Have you been able to follow through time um, these blooms? Are they something that occurs naturally, or is, as things are getting, the ocean's getting warmer, are these occurring more and more? And you've got data on that? Right. So just a reminder, our mission only lasted five years, and we had good quality data for only two years. So with two years, I cannot make um, an ed I can make an educated guess, but I cannot really say that this is caused by climate change, right? I need to look at the whole time series. And that's why using other longer uh, satellite data sets um, is important, such as MODIS, for example, that started in 2002, Sea Waves 1997. So we can go back in time, and there's been people who have used those time series to make these kind of um, uh, comments. But with solely Hawkeye, you cannot do that. You can say something about what happened this year or the year before, but you cannot talk about a decade. I'm looking forward, but it seems to me that there are multiple possibilities of how you use this. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm not sure whether Hawkeye is best suited to some of them. For example, you could look at areas that somebody identifies where there's a problem going on in the world. You could do ongoing monitoring to try to identify a problem before people know what's going on. Um, and, and there's lots of other things too. Can you? Kind of give us your take on what you think this will be most suited to and what mm -hmm. kinds of data going forward would be the most useful to collect. Right. So I always tell my students that, even in other classes, I say, what is your question? What is the question that you're trying to answer? If you're trying to answer something about climate change, do not use this because this is only two years. We would have to find a way to bridge among different uh, satellite uh, missions to do that. For our purpose, we just wanted a proof of concept mission, so this was enough. But you're absolutely right. So, for example, at the University of Georgia, there's a small satellite research lab. They actually built a CubeSat 2, launched in 2020. It was focused on coastal Georgia, right? So you can do a CubeSat mission that's just focusing on that. You can design your orbit to focus on a particular area. There's another NASA satellite mission that is going to be focused. Um, it's going to be geostationary. So think about your satellite um, TV. You are continuously getting, the, uh, you're following the same part of the Earth and you're rotating with the Earth. So with that, we're hoping that we can get um, some information about fluxes. We will have information about several about the same area several times per day. So we can see, for example, how the trigger desmium is going up and down in the uh, column, the water column, or how things are drifting. It just depends on what your question is. Um, to go back to your question, for me, this means that this, is cap this uh, technology is capable of of providing good scientific sound data. I would need a constellation to be able to answer global problems. So that would be my next step. You have mentioned uh, and beautiful images of captured over the world. You have mentioned Iceland as one of your favorite places. A couple of the places that you would like to go ground truth where would they be? Oh, that's a good one. Well, Iceland was not actually, I don't like polar regions that much. That was Jean's favorite because of the book. Um, I'm more of a, of a Bahamas girl. Um, and because I'm interested in coccolithophores, um, they appear in very, um, in very many places around the world. One of them is uh, the Black Sea. I'd like to go there and understand the Black Sea coccolithophores. Our current algorithm to detect coccolithophores does not work very well there. So that would be an interesting thing. 
figuring out the issue with the Bahamas, uh, shallow waters, um, and the effect from the sand versus the other coccolithophores. Um, I, there's also, I didn't have time to mention this, but there's actually in the Southern Ocean what we call the um, uh, calcite belt. There's a whole area around the Southern Ocean that is, uh, during certain times of the year, that is prone for coccolithophore blooms. You can see this big belt. Um, that was an, um, an interesting finding by one of my mentors, Barney Balch, um, who uh, just using satellite imagery said, oh, I think that there's a lot of coccolithophores there. But everybody was like, oh, I don't trust those satellite thingies. Um, so he was able to get, I don't know if it was NASA or NSF funding, he went on a boat, went there, and he said, yep, it's actually coccolithophores, and there's a huge formation here every year. And he was able to track that using MODIS for 20 years. So there's some really interesting stories about validation. Um, here at Skidaway, we've also done some work uh, with smaller boats and just looking at how things change in the South Atlantic by trying to fine-tune our algorithms for this particular location where we have the issue with the shallow waters, all the terrigenous input from uh, the rivers, and then um, all the chlorophyll and sediments and dissolved organic matter, and everything is mis mixing in here. So we have a really big problem here to solve. So I don't need to go too far to solve this, <laughs> but I love to travel, so um, now that you mention it, I started talking to a researcher from Peru, and he was interested in using Hawkeye imagery for Lake um, Titicaca. And that's one place where I would really like to go. Unfortunately, we cannot collect any more images with Hawkeye for him, but there's a few that he could definitely use there. Yes? If you build another, what additional capabilities do you want to build into it? Yeah, so the, the biggest thing for me that PACE has that we don't is that it is a hyperspectral sensor. And I don't have an extra slide for that. That would have been good. Um, so if I show you Alan holding here the Hawkeye, each one of these apertures is a wavelength, a color that we can distinguish. If you look at the brightness at each one of those wavelengths and make a plot of wavelength, so the color versus the brightness, you can get a spectrum. Spectrums, like the pollen one that I was showing you, now that I think about it, where's the pollen one? Here. This is a spectrum here. We have wavelength versus some sort of reflectance or brightness. Um, each one of these phytoplankton groups have different pigments, and they will have a different spectrum. We can use that to start to separate not only phytoplankton groups, but also species. And that's one of the active areas of research in my lab, trying to use hyperspectral capabilities. So having, instead of the eight little apertures, having 32, so that we can build this with more detail and try to separate species, some of them can be harmful algal blooms, and be able to say, hey, watch out, there might be a harmful algal bloom in the making. We have the higher spatial resolution too, so we might be able to provide early warning signals. So I would like hyperspectral and a constellation. I'm not asking for much. <laughs> so sir, if you're, you're talking hyper, hyper, Hyperspectral, how many bands is that? See, you know, I've eight, right? Yeah. Um, it, there's no exact number. There's, uh, it can vary. Um, I would say at least 50 or so would be good. And more in the infrared, because um, some of these turbid areas, um, we need those infrared to make atmospheric correction, like getting rid of those aerosols or getting rid of the sand from the sandstorms and things like that. 
It helps us with developing algorithms too. Um, this satellite also was not meant, um, although it, one of the nice things about it is that it does not saturate over ice or over land, so we can take images from those areas, not just the ocean. But the bands were not in the infrared, which is very helpful with vegetation, with types of minerals. Um, so it could have agricultural uh, applications, or it could have um, better um, fine tuning for all these muddy waters that I was showing you before. Oh, I'm geostationary. I want a geostationary. So yeah. Is the constellation geostationary? No, I think, yeah, I need to decide whether a constellation or geostationary, but yeah. <laughs> I can have one of each. <laughs> All right, any other questions for uh, uh, Dr. Rivera Cae? If not, let's thank her again. <laughs>